You're listening to What It's Like with Luce, a podcast highlighting ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Lucy Norris, and on today's episode, I'm sitting down with British racing driver and test driver for the Grand Tour. Growing up with a father heavily involved in the world of motorsports, she couldn't wait until it was her turn to get going on track. Sitting in a go-kart at the age of 10, it was love at first sight, and 19 years later, she is still pursuing her passion for driving. Two-time British champion and test driving cars for Amazon's The Grand Tour, she is currently gearing up to tackle single-seaters in the W Series. Sharing challenges she's overcome, career highlights, and her secret to success, here's what it's like to be Abby Eaton. Welcome, Abby. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, Before we dive into the details of your career, I'd be really interested to begin chatting a bit about where you first found your love for driving and whether motorsport was something that you grew up with or where did it come from in the beginning? Um, So my dad's always raced uh, since he was a, a young kid. So he started on bikes and then moved to carts and into cars. And I basically grew up around motorsport and you know spent my childhood at race circuits around the UK. So um, it was only really a matter of time until I got into the sport. And it, it did take a couple of years of pestering my dad to to kind of let me start. But he he bought me a go kart when I was ten, and then yeah, we are now. God, this will be my nineteenth year involved in motorsport personally. Wow, that's quite, it's quite a long time um, to be in anything, but that's really cool that you kind of, you know, kept it in the, in the family as well. So can you, I know that a lot of um, drivers start out in karting, that kind of seems to be the way to go, but can you take me back to those days and just um, explain a bit about what it was like getting in the go-kart and how you kind of knew that you wanted to turn this into a professional career and not just a hobby? Yeah, so I um, yeah started ten years old in in karting, and you know at that kind of age, I think it, you don't really know what you want to do, and um, it was just me hanging out with my dad and just you know having fun on the weekend, and then um, I did that for four years, and kind of towards the the latter part of my final year, it was you know the money that was being spent on karting. Bearing in mind, you know I'm not from a wealthy family, and it was it was mainly family funded. I had a few sponsors here and there, but um, you know, the money we were spending on on the national karting year, we decided we'd spend on cars instead. So um, my dad bought, it was a Citroen Saxo um, for my first race car and spent a year building that. So I, I did my first car race when I was 15 years old. And um, really, that was the first time that as soon as I was on a big track in a car, it just felt, I was like, yeah, this is it. This is what I want to do. I don't know why, you know, I can't explain it, but um, it just felt like that was the right place for me to be. So I was really, really pleased that we made the decision to move out of carts. Yeah, I suppose sometimes in life, well, what you're supposed to do just kind of clicks, which is, it's really nice that you found that so early as well in your life. Um, And so can you kind of talk me through what happened next then when you had that moment where you're kind of like, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do for me. How do you then move things forward? Um, so as I mentioned, kind of, it's a long process, you know, I've done it for many years now and, um, you know, it's all been kind of self-funded. So even though I've maybe raced for 19 years in total out of those 19 years, there's actually only been five, five of, yeah, five seasons where I've actually done a full season of racing. Um, so other than that, um, you know, just doing races as and where I can and what we could afford to do. Um, so, you know, really, I'm I'm still on on a bit of a mission. I'm still on that that kind of journey, really, to to chase being a you know a fully paid professional, you know, works factory driver for a, for a manufacturer. Um, and it's you know, most of sport comes with its ups and downs, just the same as as any other sport and any other kind of semi pro athlete. Um, you get awesome opportunities, and then you you kind of go through maybe a year where you're doing nothing and you know, you're questioning why you're still chasing that dream. But, um, you know, from there, I moved on into GT cars, um, did the British GT. Um, in fact, before that, I did I raced sports cars and won um, a couple of championships along the way and then moved into GT cars 2016 where we had the factory back to Maserati and then um, got spotted to um, basically have a it was it was like a shootout to have a drive in a GT3 car in Blancpain which is kind of one of the biggest GT3 championships of the world 
and I basically had to battle it out with a couple of other people that had already been racing that car for a you know, couple of years. And it was my first time at Monza in Italy, you know, really famous F1 circuit. Um, first time there, first time in a GC3 car, so the speed kind of difference was huge and you know, had to, I had to really think fast and, and try and you know, make the best of, of what was a tough situation. Managed to be fastest on the day and get the drive. So that was a, a really awesome kind of, it was a pickup that I did really for that year because that was one of the years where I was sat at home doing nothing um, purely just due, you know, due to lack of, of finance um, behind me. But yeah, came from that, had some good successes along the way. And um, I guess that my kind of results um, landed me the, the role on the Grand Tour as the test driver. Yeah, I think that's really cool and definitely something that I want to chat about as well. But, but before we go there, um, so, you know, by the sounds of things, you were doing amazing. You were, you know, winning and you were really making a name for yourself within um, the circuit. If I butcher any of the names of the, the races that you were in or anything, just forgive me. I, I'm not um, a motorsport expert, but um, in the GT world, you were kind of making a big, big name for yourself. But as you mentioned there, motorsports, from what I gather, is you know, half about how good you are as a driver, but potentially more about how much money you can put into it and sponsors and things like that. So how do you get past that barrier of frustration or how do you kind of keep going when you, you know, you're, you're putting it out there on track, but then something like money is stopping you from really reaching where you want to go? <laughs> I don't know. I ask myself that question every day. Why am I still doing it? Um, <laughs> it it's just one of those things that, you know, motorsport is is money orientated and you know a lot of people don't realize actually that a, a big percentage of the f1 grid bring money they pay to be there um it's only a small a small percentage that are actually being paid a wage um so yeah it's it's just part part of, of the sport um and you just have to keep going you know there, there are some years where or some moments where you you really do question why why you're still here you know the 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 results you're putting out on track are good you know you you feel or I feel like you know I conduct myself well you know I'll chat to anyone um you know I'd love to promote you know brands and be involved in in promotional stuff you know I'm quite happy to do that and you you start picking you know asking questions about yourself and why people don't want to be associated with you or why haven't you been given the opportunity or why haven't you got the sponsors so um you know when you start doing like that it, it really it just takes a little bit of a a kind of you know bang your head against the wall and, and stop stop doing that and just focus on the job in hand and you know get yourself back out on track again but it is tough and i'm sure you know it's not just motorsport there's various other um sports out there that when you're kind of trying to break into that elite level that you know you, it's just similar um obstacles that you face yeah definitely i can imagine how frustrating it must be though um at, at times to have that as such a barrier but you know you're continuing to push through it and i love that so um yeah i suppose once you kind of reach that point where you you potentially couldn't take it any further in in racing for the minute and you switched across to some tv work with um the grand tour and i believe you did the drive before that correct me if i'm wrong but can you take me yeah. back to those days what it was like entering into maybe that more commercial side of racing and, and how how that was for you um so i didn't particularly do it because i didn't have any racing it just kind of happened so if i was racing then i would have done it alongside each other um and when we filmed drive for itv i think i was actually still racing then um in fact yeah I, I, in the same year that we won drive with professor green i won my second championship so um but yeah it's it just kind of happened and um you know great fun to be involved with um shame that drive only happened for one season but um you know it was a lot of laughs and some of the celebrities involved were you know really good crack and um you know teaching them the different kind of categories of motorsport was good fun um and obviously much better because we won so yeah, yeah i've only got positive to say about drive <laughs> um and then, yeah, being involved in, in the Grand Tour, again, that came about just after, I think, I won the Blanc Pan race that, that I got the drive for. Um, so, yeah, again, into the world of kind of, you know, film and TV, I guess. You know, I'd done a few filming jobs for TV commercials and, and TV adverts and so on. So I'd kind of been in that world a little bit anyway. But, you know, to see how many people are involved in a big production like the Grand Tour, you know, it's, it's quite... Um, you know, fascinating to see how many people work on on 
producing the episodes. Um, again, a lot of fun. Um, you know, I grew up watching Clarkson and um, Hammond and May on the TV when, when I was little. So to actually be working with them is something, you know, very special to have on your CV. Yeah, I'd say it must have been really cool. And did you get to go on all the, the trips and kind of the, the tours they were doing as well? I went on a couple of them, yeah. Um, so probably my favourite one was when we went to Sweden and we did some ice driving on on a big ice lake. Um, and then um, went to Azerbaijan and I had to basically drive across uh, all these random roads and whatnot uh, in this really, really old Renault 5 and they were in big comfy Bentleys and <laughs> Aston Martins and stuff. So yeah, that was good fun as well. Yeah, I can imagine. That sounds like great fun. And so why did you decide to, to finish up there? Uh, I didn't decide. Um, so it's basically the, the um, I think the original contract was set out for like three years in that particular format uh, with having the, the test driver and so on. Um, and then after the third year, you know, they said, right, let's do something different. So they got rid of the track, they got rid of the tent, and they're basically just going to focus on doing kind of specials. So um, in that sense, you know, I wasn't needed to do the um, the track stuff and the lap times. Um, so, you know, I haven't, a lot of people, you know, say online, oh, why did you get sacked? I didn't get sacked. Nothing was ended. You know, it's, it's just that the, um, the format is different. So... You know, I might be back in the future for, you know, a guest appearance or so, um, but you'll have to watch the next season to find out. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, and obviously, so now you're moving into the W series, which I think is really cool. It's, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I read was it's an all-female series that allows people to enter. They fund you, um, so you don't have to worry about all of that. Um, so can you just tell me about how that came about in a nutshell and what that next chapter is going to be like for you? Yeah, so um, W Series was launched in 2019, or I think it might have been the end of 2018, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and it's the world's first female-only single-seater championship, and not only that, it's fully funded, and um, there's a prize fund at the end of it, so um, yeah, for me, when it was first kind of launched and announced, I didn't really agree with the format. Um, okay. I've raced against guys and girls, so I didn't particularly need a female-only championship, um, you know, I want to race against the best drivers and, you know, the best drivers might happen to be male. You know, I don't want to disclude um, racing against them. So um, for me, it was a little bit worrying and I kind of gave an opinion that I thought it would be better off being done in a different format. Um, and I'd also been working quite hard to go out and race in Australia. Um, so, you know, for me, if W Series was like a GT championship or touring car championship, then 100% I would have done it. But it's single seaters and I'd never, ever done single seaters in my entire life. So um, for me, it was too much of a chance to take. Um, there were uh, other previous championships, female only championships that really just did not do anything for women in motorsport. It was horrendous. So um, I stayed clear of it, um, went out to Australia racing out there. And I, you know, I kept an eye on the W Series and how it was going on. And, you know, I'll give them their dues. They, you know, they were, they were fantastic with how, how they orchestrated everything. Um, the engineering team, you know, the mechanics, the um, physiotherapy, you know, everything that was given to the drivers, you know, really, they, they put money where their mouth was, basically. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that meant that the racing on track was fantastic as well. Um, so... After the Australian thing, um, I thought, right, I probably should, you know, see if I can get into W Series here. You know, I see that what they're doing is good and why they're doing it the way they are. Um, so, you know, completely put my hands up and said, look, you know, I got it wrong to start off with. Um, I think there was a lot of us that, that kind of had our reservations, to be honest, um, and probably a lot of us that have, you know, had our, our had our minds changed. So. Um, yeah, applied to do W Series at the end of 2019, and then it's basically a um, vetting process that happens, and then you get invited down to an assessment, and there's on-track assessment, engineering, fitness, all sorts of stuff that goes into it, and then thankfully I was offered a place for 2020, and um, obviously that was postponed for the coronavirus reasons, so that's been moved to 2021, and this year we'll be racing alongside F1, so... Wow. Yeah, bit of bit of a turn of events. 
Yeah, that's really exciting though. I'd say that's going to be really cool. Um, and so interesting to hear, you know, you, you explain how that process kind of came about for you and your reservations in the beginning. And forgive me for being cliche here. I know you've probably been asked this question a million times, but I am curious to know your experience with it. Um, obviously, there's always kind of a thing around women in motorsport and how underrepresented uh, we are and all that kind of thing. So can you tell me what the process has been like for you as a female in motorsport and whether or not it's been a limiting factor, anything you've kind of noticed along the way or, or what has it been like? Um, in general, I haven't really taken any notice of anything because um, from a young age, I knew it was something that I wanted to do, you know, watching my dad race. So I was like, that's what I want to do. I, I never asked the question, can girls race? It was, I want to race dad. Um, so, you know, to me, I didn't need that female role model. I didn't need a female person in the spotlight to want to chase my dreams. Um, but I understand that there are some girls out there that maybe, you know, don't, don't have that same mentality as me. So um, to increase kind of female um, awareness or awareness of females in motorsport, I think is, is important to try and do. Um, and W Series obviously work to do that with drivers, but also they've got female engineers and mechanics and so on. Um, and just give them a bit of a, a platform really. But, um, you know, in terms of back when I started nearly 20 years ago, there was probably only me and one, maybe two of the female drivers that I knew. Um, now, when you, you look at it, there's probably a female in every single class. So, you know, there's probably six or seven females in, in a kind of race weekend, if you like. So still nothing in comparison to the amount of guys, but, um, it's you probably compare the same of, of with ballet in the ballet world you know there's probably still a lot of female that outweigh the male um you know participants in it it's just part part and parcel of it but um i guess kind of the negative things you come up against is you know comments that are made um mainly as, as a kid really it was you know mechanics saying to the little kid drivers you know don't let that girl beat you and you know for me stuff like that is said tongue-in-cheek it's it's not meant you know really if a girl does well the amount of respect and praise you get is huge so you know really it's it's if you as my dad would say if you can cut the mustard then it doesn't matter who you are you know if you can drive you can drive um but you know perhaps there are other girls out there that haven't had quite the same uh response as myself but you know i'm there because i want to be there i'm there because i'm doing something that i love and i will be there because i'm fast so maybe i'm just stubborn and headstrong in comparison to some of the other women but there we are yeah no i love that though i think um you know in in anything that's so competitive and, and fast-paced and you know as the industry is you kind of need that thick skin and it sounds like you you have it quite naturally as well which is really nice to hear and so Leading on from that, um, I believe you're a two-time British champion. So I'd be curious to know from your perspective and your opinion, what do you think it takes to become a champion? Do you think, you know, there's particular traits that you've noticed that the most successful people around you have or that you yourself have? Or what, what's your kind of experience been in that sense of, of of the words success winning all that kind of thing um i think you have to be really focused on the job that you've got to do um i think you need to be really motivated as well because you know there are a lot of times where you know things get really tough and you have to keep at it and you know there'll be obstacles thrown your way there'll be tough times and you've just got to keep keep on going being resilient um you know being hungry and just you know, live and breathe what you want to achieve. And, you know, if you do that enough, then, you know, you'll get there. Um, you know, having said that, I've lived and breathed it for, you know, 19 years and I'm still not exactly where I want to be. But, you know, looking back, you know, I've done quite a lot of cool things. So, um, but I'm just very ambitious and I always want to push on to do more. Um, but yeah, I think you've got to be hard work, harder working, driven, motivated, focused and be resilient as well. Yeah, and you say, you know, oh, you're not where you want to be. But for me sitting on this side, you've done a lot of things, um, you know, in, in those 19 years. So congrats to you. It's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I guess I know there, there's probably maybe a few to choose from. But if you did have to pick 
the biggest challenge that you think you've overcome in those 19 years, what would it be? Um, I think the, the challenge that was maybe the hardest to kind of bounce back from was um, that when I went out to race in Australia. So it was kind of something that I'd wanted to do for ages. I put my heart and soul into it. And um, again, due to money, it was kind of a last minute thing that we were able to do. And um, I didn't really, I didn't have any testing. I just went in it completely blind. Um, and, you know, it was kind of stink or swim. And, um, you know, I was super unprepared. And I was with a team that, you know, it really wasn't particularly a good good fit um, for kind of um, various reasons. And, yeah, I didn't really give it a shot that I should have given it. And, um, you know, I just felt embarrassed. I felt kind of mortified. Um, you know, I felt disappointed that I'd spent ages wanting to do this this championship and, um, yeah, it didn't go particularly how I wanted it to go. And, you know, it really knocked me back and it was just a bit like, you know, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, you know, you, you start questioning yourself and, you know, question why you've put all that effort in and, and so on. And, it's very difficult to pull yourself out of it sometimes. Um, and like you probably track to other racing and drivers, they say the same thing that as soon as you say, right, that's it, I'm giving up, I've had enough for this. There'll be something, some opportunity that pops up around the corner that's like, mm, you could give up, but there's this opportunity here. Um, so yeah, it probably took two or three weeks of, um, you know, me thinking, right, that's it, I'm not doing it anymore. Uh, another opportunity arose on the other side. So yeah, that was probably the, the hardest thing to kind of pick myself out of. Um, and still now, you know, I look back at it and, you know, it's still something that sticks in my mind type thing. But again, all athletes will have these moments and it's up to you whether you kind of dwell on them or you learn from them and, and move forward from it. Yeah, definitely. I feel like it's that kind of thing of, when one door closes another one opens as cliche as it is but you you might not even realize it's happening but you know it's it's exactly as you demonstrated before it's that resilience that you seem to have that just keeps you going or maybe it's just such an intense love for, for the industry and for what you're doing but um yeah that that's interesting to hear that you had to go through that and so I know we spoke about the fact that you're going to be in the W series in 20, it is 2021. My brain is not in this year yet. I still think it's 2020. <laughs> um, yeah. But what is the ultimate goal for you with all of this? Is it Formula One or where do you want to see yourself if no boundaries existed? You know, what's the ultimate dream? Um, you know, I'd love to just be a, a factory driver for a manufacturer. Um, Formula One for me is not my end goal. It never has been. Um, but I think kind of GT cars or um, like touring cars, you know, Australian supercars, that kind of stuff. I'd love to be a works driver for, for um, you know, car manufacturer and, and live and breathe. And, you know, every single day is, is about racing and getting the most out of your next performance and so on. Um, you know, W Series, I think in the short term, you know, I've got a two year plan. Uh, this first year is going to be a massive learning year for me. Um, <clears throat> haven't particularly got any testing sorted for um, pre-season. And uh, as I mentioned, I've never raced anything like this. And, you know, most GT cars or bits and bobs, you can kind of jump in and after a day, you, you know, you're on the pace. But um, cars like Formula 3 cars and single seaters, it takes a bit of fine tune. And um, there are a lot of girls on the grid that have come from quite wealthy backgrounds so you know they're fortunate enough to do lots of, of testing prior to the season starting so I'm just gonna have to jump in both feet and think fast and hold on really but um, yeah I'm kind of not really putting any pressure on myself for this year it, you know it, what will be will be and um, my aim is just to learn as much as possible get through to year two and then um, we can push on in the next year. Yeah, definitely. And I'm I'm sure you'll do fine given your literal track record. Um, I'm sure you'll take to it really well. And so within that, you know, you're moving to kind of a new a new type of car and all that kind of thing. Do you get nervous? Do you ever feel scared? Probably isn't the right word, but even just how fast you're driving, how much risk you are taking when you get in the car every time. How do you 
keep your mind settled in those moments? Um, I think the main the main thing with athletes and probably racing drivers more so is that it's the own pressure you put on yourself. Um, you know, most of the stuff that I've done, I've been in the top three and, um, you know, I want to keep that, that record going, you know, I want, I want to keep those results as they are, but, um, in probably a year ago, I, do you know what I regret? I regret not doing the first year of W series because I would be in a completely different, um, you know, mindset at the moment, the only fear you have is fear of the unknown because I haven't got the experience, you know, I don't know how to react to certain things. And the only way that you get confidence with that kind of stuff is actually getting in the car and driving it. So, um, you know, there's no kind of, you know, I'm not scared about it. I'm not particularly nervous about it. It's just, um, there's going to be a lot to learn and a lot to deal with. So, um, yeah, you know, don't get me wrong. There'll definitely be nerves on the night before the first race. And, um, yeah, I think nerves are a good thing. Um, if you use them properly, um, you know, they help focus the mind and hopefully give you give you good results at the end of it. If you weren't nervous at all, I think there's something wrong. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that as well. I think a bit of nerves are always good and they can kind of drive you forward as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting to hear from you. And I do just have one more question and I'm going to let you get on with your lunch. Um, so if I put your 10 year old self in front of you today, thinking all the way back to that kid that just wanted to, to race go-karts, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give having been through all your career, um, pieces, and then also just life in general to that kid moving forward? It would be look after your body, um, oh. you know, as a, as a, you know, in karting and motorsport, anything um, kind of car related, your body takes a real beating and, um, you know, you're always kind of um, compensating for poor fitting seats or poor fitting, um, you know, seating positions that is not particularly how your body should be and your body kind of you know deals with it um and then if you keep it going for years and years eventually your body will have issues that you kind of almost you know the damage has been done so um yeah look after your body um get someone in you know that really knows about you know where your strength needs to be where in in your um in your body so like trunk strength is really important in motorsport um posture as well because with the belts and the seat and your hands device and all that kind of equipment your your neck ends up being pushed forward a lot of the time and you you end up really rounded in your shoulders and your, your upper back um so you need really strong upper back you need really strong glutes really strong core um and all that kind of stuff just to kind of make sure basically you're forced into a bad posture in the car so you need to have all the corrective stuff to make sure that when you're at the car, you're not in that kind of rounded position that can give you problems. So I would go back to my 10 year old self and tell me that. And probably 10 year old me would say, whatever, <laughs> what? I'm not doing that. <laughs> but yeah, that's the most, most important thing that I've learned over um, this time. Yeah, I think that's so interesting because I feel like motorsports is one of those things that people never give the credit to in terms of like the fitness aspect and things like that. Cause they kind of, I don't know, just in, in a general sense, I think people just think, Oh, you just sit in the car and drive it, but there's so much more that goes into it, which um, you've just demonstrated there. So that's so interesting. Oh yeah. Like driving a race car is nothing like driving a road car. It's completely different. And my hairdresser said to me once, what, why do you always go to the, why are you always working out? Why are you always training? And uh, yeah, that's the one thing that winds me up the most. There's nothing that, um, you know, you can say whatever you want about female drivers and all that kind of stuff that, that really doesn't get to me. But as soon as someone says, you don't need to be fit to race a car, I'm like, oh, my God, you do. Yeah. You really do. It's one of the toughest things. And you look at the F1 drivers, you know, a lot of them do triathlons. They do, you know, long distance endurance stuff. The the neck strength is, is stronger than a rugby player. You know, it's there's a lot involved in, in driving a, a race car successfully. And, um, yeah, it's hard work. <laughs> yeah definitely looks it even just from you know if you follow along on Instagram with any of the drivers the stuff they have to do to their neck looks so painful um and mm. what you were mentioning about posture I mean my posture is terrible just from sitting at a desk so I can't imagine how it would get from the car but yeah so it's such an interesting insight there 
that is all my questions. I just want to say thank you so much for giving up your time again. It's been so interesting diving into your story. Um, and yeah, thanks so much. That's well, okay. My pleasure. And if you, you want to do a follow up one mid season or something, then I'll be happy to come and have another chat. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, please rate, share and leave a comment if you like what you hear. And don't forget to follow at what it's like pod on Instagram and Facebook. To find out more about Abby and her career, visit the links provided in the show notes. I'll be back on Thursday with more inspiring stories, but for now this has been What It's Like with Luce.